So on the 8th of April 2014, a security advisory was released on the internet by people at Google and other places that had discovered a bug in a package called OpenSSL. One problem with a package like OpenSSL is that being so pervasive, if a bug does get into it, then it'll filter out onto lots and lots of machines. So to understand this Heartbleed bug, we actually need to understand in detail how the Heartbeat protocol works. So let's move into the office and actually understand how Heartbeat works. Like all internet protocols, these are defined in the request for comments or RFCs. And if you look down here, there'll be a link to where you can download this one and you can go from there to find anyone. There's a Heartbeat request, which we send out, and there's a Heartbeat response, which comes back from the other side. They're made up of three or four things. We've got this type field, and this can either be a value of one, which means request a heartbeat, or a value of two, which means I'm sending a response to a request that you've actually sent. We then have this payload, and this can be anything the person requesting the heartbeat likes. It's just some unique value, it doesn't even have to be unique, but it helps if it is, that they send to the server, and the server, when it responds, sends back exactly the same response there. Finally, we have what's called some padding, and this is at least 16 bytes of random data which just bulks out the actual message that's sent. It's ignored by the other side, but it's there as part of the protocol. What this means, though, is that even though we know how big the message is, we don't know how big the payload is unless we actually send over the length of it, because we don't know how long the padding is either. So we also send over, before we send the payload, two bytes, which gives us the payload length, which means the payload can be anything up to 65,536 bytes in length. And that all gets sent as part of the request, and the server's job is to copy that payload, create a response message around it, and send it back to me to tell me that it's met that response. And if we just look down here at the bottom, it says, if the payload length of a received heartbeat message is too large, the received heartbeat message must be discarded silently. What that means is, if I send you a message where the payload length doesn't make sense, for example, it's greater than the actual length of the message, then the server is meant to ignore that message completely, not try and process it and send a response, because it doesn't make sense. And it's that handling of that situation that causes the heart bleed bug in OpenSSL. OpenSSL is written in C, so we're going to look at the code here, but I'll walk you through it. So if you're not familiar with the C language, we should be able to follow it without any issues. So I've opened up a file here called t1lib, which is the file that contains the implementation of the heartbeat extension. If we scroll right down to the bottom of the file, we find that there are a couple of functions that implement the heartbeat protocol. First one we're going to look at is this one called tls1 underscore heartbeat, which is actually the responsible for sending the messages out over the connection. It does some checking to check that there's no heartbeat already being sent. And then we come to this bit of code, which actually generates the message. And there's no problem with this code. It's generating the message in a way that makes sense. It's allocating memory here of the right length. It's putting in the relevant bytes. It's saying it's a request message. This is how big the payload is. It's 18 bytes long. It's generating the payload. And it's sending its random padding bytes out over. And then we can see here, it calls SSL3 write bytes to send that out over the network connection to the other side. So that's all fine. There doesn't seem to be any problems with that. But if we scroll up a bit, we come to the code which processes the heartbeat. And that's in a function called TLS1 process heartbeat. And what this does, it gets sent a message that's been received from the other side. And it starts pressing that to see whether it's a valid heartbeat request. And if it is, it will generate the response to the other side. So it reads in from the package the heartbeat type, and it also extracts out the payload length from there. Now, one of the things you have to do when dealing with network protocols is that there is a defined method for how data is sent over the network, and that is what's called a big endian way of transmitting things. PC computers tend to be little endian, and so on, and so you sometimes have to convert between it. So that's why we have this function network to short here, which does that conversion for us. So we get the length of the payload, there's then some more code which does some tests. And then we say, if we've got a heartbeat request message, we're going to process that. And so it's going to generate the response. So the first thing it does is it allocates memory for the response message. And so that's one byte 
for the type, in this case it's a heartbeat response, two bytes for the length of the payload, then however many bytes are required for the payload. And remember, it's read that from the actual packet that's come in. And it then creates its padding. In this case, it's going to generate 16 bytes again. So it allocates that memory, and assuming that gets allocated properly, it starts to fill in those details. So it's saying here that I want a response message, and so it says that's the type. And it sets the payload in there again. And again, it's having to convert it from the computer's type into the network type, so it's in the standardized format. And so it's putting payload bytes in there. So that's the value it read in. And then it uses this function here, memcopy, which just copies a block of memory from one location to another to copy payload number of bytes from the original message which had the payload in it. It then adds the padding and sends the data out over the network. Well, what's the problem with that? That code works, and it works fine, providing the packets it has sent are standard. The problem comes, the heart bleed bug as it is comes, if the packet that we send isn't standard, it is crafted maliciously. And in particular, the key problem is this payload length that we use to copy the bytes from one memory location to another. We read that in from the packet that we sent. And so if we create a packet that has a payload, say, of 64K, 65,536 bytes, but only actually provides, say, eight bytes of data, when it starts to copy things, it's going to copy those eight bytes of data but this mem copy instruction here is going to carry on copying for another 65,528 worth of bytes. Now, where are those extra bytes going to come from? Well, they're going to come from whatever follows on in memory, in the computer's memory that's there. If we're lucky, that data will be meaningless. It'll be garbage that's been left in there. It doesn't make any sense. But it could also be details of previous requests, usernames, passwords. And if we're really unlucky, it could be the actual security certificates used to actually encrypt the data. Fixing this was really easy. They just added checks, like it described in the RFC, that the payload length made sense in the context of the length of the actual message. But let's actually see what happens if we take a server that's still got the old version and see what data we can collect if we run this heart bleed bug. So I've set up a virtual machine running OpenBSD using a version that's still got the heart bleed bug. So if I open a new web window here, I can pop to the web server. This is running on the local machine and if I switch now to my command line I've also got a piece of code that I downloaded off the web and no we're not going to give you a link to this one that will actually exploit Heartbleed and slurp 64k of data from that server and we'll be able to look at it in the window here. It's written in Python and we're going to attack the server that we've got here. Don't worry this is a local IP you won't be able to connect to it and if we just run that we can see the data that we've got. Now the data that we get back is completely random. It depends where, when the server received that message, it put it in its own computer's memory. So in this case, we've not got anything interesting. But if we run it again, so this time when we've run it, it's actually given us some useful information. So what have we got here? Well, at the top, we've got some details about what's going on. It's telling us that it's connected to the server, that it's sent some data over it sent the hello message and so on which is setting up the TLS and that it sent the heartbeat request and that it's received our response. Now this heartbeat request has been formatted in a way that it's sent a very small amount of data but asked for a large amount of data or said it's a large amount of data so what gets sent back is about 64k's worth of memory. It's then dumped this memory out to the screen so we can see what's going on. So on the left-hand column here, we've got its position within the data that's returned. So we start off at zero, and we're increasing in hexadecimal down here. So we've got 16, 32, 48, and so on, all in hexadecimal down here, up to 256. Along here, we have the hexadecimal values of each of those bytes. And on the right-hand side, the ASCII values of them, what those characters actually mean. So in this bit, we've got part of our heartbeat response at the top. But as we look down, we've actually started to get some interesting information out of the server. In this case, we can see what the referring URL was, what encodings is accepted, and we can start to see earlier things that I've been doing when I was testing this. So I started to set up WordPress, so we can see that someone tried to access that. So it's a bit like uh, panning for gold. We stick our 
metaphorical sieve into the mud and we pull out things and we're shaking it about and occasionally all we pull out is mud, just random data that we can't decipher. But occasionally we pull out and we start to get that and we get those gold nuggets that we're interested in. We get the passwords, we get the service certificates and so on, which we can use to do nefarious things if we were so inclined. Now, of course, you wouldn't necessarily want to do this by hand, but it'd be very easy to write software that could look for these patterns and just sit there continually fetching data undetected until it found what it was looking for. And everybody was going to click on that one. Yeah, well, it turned fine. out that, um, that the video that behind that was a person talking about the fight. 